Go for it, Arif. Okay, great. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Lillwood. Um, as we usually do, we keep the introductions short and let our speakers actually tell us about themselves and introduce themselves. So Peter, please tell us about your living history. No, no, th thank you very much. So firstly, I'm, I'm delighted to be invited here because uh, I never really thought of myself as a biophysicist or a biological physicist. So I feel that I've been welcomed into a new community and thank you for doing that. So that, that's kind. So um, I, I don't have slides. I I thought I would just talk a little bit about my own history and um, it's sort of interesting that we were just discussing imposter syndrome because all of us who uh, you know, get into this life uh, have different stories and all of us feel that at some point we were outsiders uh, even if nobody else does. Um, so you know, I grew up on a small farm in southern England um, to a, an only child. I spent most of my young life plowing um, and it gives you a lot of time to think. Uh, and at some very early age, I decided I was going to become a theoretical physicist. I have no idea why. I don't even know that I knew what that was. Uh, I decided I was going to go to Cambridge to do this. And I don't know why I even thought that because none of my family had ever been to university. But it turns out that if you just want to do things, it, sometimes they happen, so I did. Um, uh, so my track record in science is that I have trouble holding down a job, so I travel around a lot. So I was a student in Cambridge, both as an undergraduate. I spent a year at MIT on a fellowship and decided not to stay there for graduate school. I went back and did a PhD in Cambridge. Then I came to uh, uh, Bell Labs as a postdoc. Bell Labs may be a distant memory for many of you, but Bell Labs, I'll talk about it a bit in a moment, was a uh, kind of formative institution for science, actually, I think, as, a, as an industrial lab that was doing very basic science. Um, after being there for a while, I went back to Cambridge, was a professor there, ran the physics department. Um, uh, after doing that for a while, you know, if you've been chair of department, you actually have to get out of town after you've done it. Uh, so, so I left, I came to Chicago, not so much to come to the university, but to go to Argonne National Lab because I wanted to work on energy. Uh, and so I was at Argonne for a few years, I ran the lab for a few years, uh, and now I'm kind of a retired from Argonne and I'm just a professor of physics at the University of Chicago. Uh, and, and so lately writing uh, papers on these things. So a bit of thought about the evolution of the subject of biological physics. I mean, I. I'm apparently in this now because I'm now on a National Academy study writing a report about the TED, the decadal report on biological physics. I was supposed to know something about this. So I've been trying to understand what the field is. Um, for me, uh, the, this was Bell Labs. Um, uh, I have a connection to the previous speaker because of course Bell Labs was close to Princeton. And at that time, Stan Leibler was making a transition from theoretical physics into biological physics and to, from uh, uh, from theory into experiment. But at Bell Labs at that time, we had uh, uh, David Tank, Alan Gelprin, John Hopfield, uh, pioneering the very early ideas about what became machine learning, uh, uh, thinking about brain imaging with uh, um, developing technologies for that. And I was running the theory department and we would of course hire every year, we were able to hire incredibly smart postdocs. And they all would turn up and we would hire them thinking that they were going to do strongly correlated materials and superconductors and things like this. And after about six months, they would file into my office and say, do you mind if I go work on biological physics? And, and so, so, and this was people like uh, Sebastian Sung uh, you know, Parthamitra, Anuman Sengupta, all of whom have gone on to, um, uh, to, to do uh, sort of tremendous things in this field, um, driven, I will say, by very practical ideas. Um, and eventually it sort of dragged in people, senior theorists like Daniel Fisher, Boris Schreiman, and to a certain extent myself uh, and others, because the depth and breadth and importance of the problems was, was, was there. Um, uh, so at some point, Bell Labs folded, um, you know, blame it on uh, politics. Uh, so uh, we can talk more about why Bell Labs was so wonderful and what it did. It was a very 
a practical organization working on things that really mattered, but with a vision that was a century long. Uh, so I got to go back to Cambridge. Um, and at Cambridge, England, I sort of inherited a, uh, uh, a history of what I realized was in many ways the invention of biophysics by um, Bragg and others who realized that having invented X-ray technologies, what you should use them to do was really to understand the structure of life. Uh, and there was a very deliberate decision made by Bragg and others in the 40s and 50s to go after that direction of, of, of physical sciences and not um, uh, you know, more fundamental, you know, let's look at smaller and smaller things. Uh, so for example, CERN could clearly have been built around Cambridge, uh, but instead of going after the building of bigger, bigger and bigger colliders, uh, there was a decision to go after biological physics, which led, of course, to uh, uh, the invention of, of, of other organizations like laboratory molecular biology, which one should note is actually a spin-off of the Cavendish lab. Um, uh, so, um, unfortunately, Cambridge made a bad decision um, in the 70s. Uh, it's a small town. The university was sort of crammed in the center of this, and they needed to build, build out. Uh, so they made the decision of, of sending physics west and biology south. And that broke the connection, actually, between those two things. And it was sort of disastrous. Uh, and I spent a bit of time trying to build that back uh, by, um, by bringing biology back, actually, into the Cavendish lab with some level of success. Um, but I moved to Argonne in, in uh, 2011. Uh, coming, you know, uh, again, I've, I mean, by the way, I, I will claim that I've always been doing science all through this, but some level of this, a lot of this is administration. And one of the things that, that organizations like Argonne has is have big tools, uh, a big synchrotron, the ability to study with x-rays things at, you know, amazing precision and great volume, uh, tremendous computing. And I got hooked at that point on the idea of the biological connector which is that I felt that we actually had the tools where within a decade or so, it might actually be possible to measure the connectivity of the location of every neuron in a substantial brain. And that's, I think, beginning to happen. Um, so my own involvement in that has actually been what I call blue collar theory. Uh, if you're proposing to take an exabyte of data, you need to think hard about how you're gonna analyze that data, what you will get out of it, what you will do that. So that's driven me into uh, ideas of machine learning. So my own research, um, I am basically a statistical physicist. Uh, the problems that you get into if you think about statistical physics can be classical or quantum. Uh, so I've worked on material science, on superconductors, on uh, materials for energy, on battery technologies. Lately, uh, that has driven me into thinking about active matter uh, and energy technologies and, and, and sort of biological physics as well. So one of the questions I actually have for this audience is, how should we be teaching biological physics in the physics context? So this is a big question for us now, is to think about how we expose undergraduate students to doing that. Uh, recognize that now biological physics is a very large part of our PhD programs. We generate more biological physics PhDs than we do in atomic and molecular physics every year. They're coming out of physics departments. This is how people self-identify in that. Uh, but I don't think we've grasped how we should be teaching uh, and introducing people to biological physics at an undergraduate level. So at that point, I'm going to kind of stop. Uh, and, and of course, uh, open to all kinds of questions and comments and others. Thank you so much, Peter. And I think that is an excellent question for discussion. Um, I see the tree has a rent up. So why don't you go ahead? Um, thank you so much, Peter. What what uh, what an idea to flip the classroom and turn over the questioning, <laughs> questioning the other way around. Uh, but I want to un answer your question with a question. Uh, sure. So, so, so uh, I want to ask you, especially in the context of this decadal survey, about a rite of passage that so many uh, tenure track assistant professors who are biological physicists and physics departments are put through. And I'm not talking about being made to teach Jackson electrodynamics because 
that we've all got. <laughs> but in a physics colloquium, inevitably we are asked, but why is this physics? So, yeah, so, yeah, so it's, you know, it, 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 it's, look, it, it's, it's fair enough. I mean, so, and I'm doing that right now. Obviously, you know, we're, um, we're interviewing uh, uh, for faculty jobs at Chicago at the moment. I'm hoping that we will recruit some biological physicists into this and we, and we come with this and what's the boundary, right? So, um, uh, so I always think that biological physics is something which demonstrates physics principles that are purely physics and not just biology. So, uh, so my hope actually is that biological physics, we learn things about physics. Um, and, and I suppose the other way, to, I, again, I'm going to flip the question a little bit back to you. My, by training, I'm a condensed matter physicist, right? So up until 70s or 80s or 90s in many universities, condensed matter physics was not a suitable subject, subject for any physics department. Uh, it was called squalid state physics in some parts of uh, some parts of the country, um, and the idea that complexity by itself generates new knowledge and new you know it, it's is something that actually the physics community had to be hard brought to, um, and it's uh, the idea of a complexity generating principles that I think is biological physics. And by that, I would distinguish a little bit against biophysics, because to a great extent now, if I look at bio, my colleagues who identify as biophysicists, they're all in the chemistry department. I mean, you can tell that now, actually, if you go to the James Frank Institute, which is there, which is sort of jointly between physics, chemistry and biology, the only people who identify themselves as biophysicists are actually in the chemistry department. Uh, so biological physics, I think, is something which has a sort of greater depth, greater principle. Uh, and, and the idea is that you know, out of complexity, you know, more is different. It's just the next generation of that. And I think that's biological physics. So you know, uh, stand up for that when asked. Say, how dare you think that physics um, is just uh, you know, reductio ad absurdum. There's much more to our subject which is constructive and generative uh, and beyond this. And, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, you know and, and frankly, you know, I mean, I think the dead subjects actually in physics these days are really those which are regarded as more fundamental. Uh, super, thanks so much. And we'll do onward. Um, I think there's one more question, if it can be quick, that's great. And then we'll move on because uh, we're a bit, running a bit late. Uh, go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, so in the same spirit with the question you asked, uh, there are uh, other areas in physics which are not classified as physics, like, like soft matter, if, like study of suspensions or granular materials or like the soft matter physics. You talk about that and it's considered more as engineering than physics people say it's more mechanical or chemical engineering than, than, it, than, than it is physics. You say you want so, to comment on this? So, yeah. so or do you have a specific question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, what suggestion would you have for well, young... I, mean, I, 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 actually think, I actually think that that point of view is just wrong. So firstly, I'm in Chicago, which of course has a huge tradition in soft matter physics, which is why we're uh, pushing, pushing very hard on this, and it, and it comes in, it comes in exactly the same way. Well, so, so the the um, uh, uh, you know, you know, look, my my view of physics is physics is what physicists do. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so the um, uh, so, uh, and also my view of physics is that physics is something to be proud of because it's practical. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, so if you want to be a mathematician, go join a math department. And I, and I think maths is wonderful. It's very deliberately abstract. Doing stuff in physics that is deliberately abstract and has no application is not physics. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so, so I, I, you know, I mean, don't be brave about this. And by the way, you know, you're, you're growing, as I pointed out, is that, you know, every year the, um, 
uh, American Physical Society uh, interviews all PhD graduates and asks them to identify themselves in what in terms of what they do, right? Mm. Uh, and biological physics, you know, is growing more rapidly than any area. People who have physics PhDs and they are identified with that. So it's kind of the wave, I, th I think, of the future. So don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, again so much for a wonderful talk. Given the time, I think we're going to skip the next.